Hey, what's up, VC? It's Steve again, Harmless Rebel, and it's time for another episode of What's Spinning. Uh, this will mostly be metal. Uh, I'll start off with a uh, a couple other things before we jump into the metal. But uh, um, I basically just pulled all the stuff out of my car. The whole my whole front seat and glove box were overflowing with music. So I just wanted to share what I've been listening to as I've been uh, out and about uh, for the last month or so. Um, so first up, uh, just kind of jump into this. I, I may have mentioned this in another video. I know I've mentioned it talking to a couple of people uh, on the VC, but I've been in a real big uh, thin, ki thin kizzy, uh, thin Lizzy kick lately. Um, I'm always listening to Thin Lizzy, but uh, for the last month or so, I, I've been listening to uh, at least one of the album of theirs a day, and. Uh, uh, as I mentioned on that video, uh, this has been spinning in the car quite a bit lately. Uh, Bad Reputation from 1977. Um, I love this album. I, I love all their albums. Um, this one is actually a, uh, a UK pressing on Vertigo. But uh, I just pulled that out and that's been spinning quite a bit in the car. Uh, another one that I uh, just kind of pulled out at random. Um, was just in the mood to listen to it was uh, To Hell With The Devil from Striper. There's one of the mini covers to that album. And, and this is one that I ran across a couple months ago in uh, at Half Price Books. I finally got around to listening to it. And, and I'll talk about uh, this in a future video, but uh, I found out recently that there's a bunch of comps and stuff out there of Jimi Hendrix uh, that aren't really Jimi Hendrix. I guess there was a, a couple of guys that uh, recorded a bunch of music that they attributed to Jimi Hendrix um, as projects that he played guitar on prior to going solo or prior to um, putting together uh, the Jimi Hendrix experience. And uh, a lot of that stuff is stuff that I've seen people show on the VC that they think is... Uh, Jimi Hendrix and on first listen I thought that this that some of the stuff on here was too until I, I, I did some research on it because um, there there's some uh, vocals on here that are that are really terrible and I couldn't figure out um, what it was until I, I did a little bit of research on the album and uh, did find out that it, this was in fact a live Jimi Hendrix show uh, and and the the horrible vocals are the drunken whales of Jim Morrison. Um, this goes by a couple of different names. This one is, uh, it, it's called Jammin' Live at the Scene Club. New York City. Uh, there's some great stuff on here. Jimi Hendrix sounds phenomenal as always. But uh, there's a song on here called Morrison's Lament and I didn't put it together but I was listening to it and you hear a guy start uh, wailing on the mic uh, not wailing more like uh, mumbling on the mic um, something about uh, put it in her ass he says that over and over again uh, and it, just a lot of incoherent mumbling with Jimmy Hendrix playing in the background and it turns out that that's Jim Morrison and he was apparently drunk as hell uh, and may have been on something as well. I don't know. They, but they say he was drunk for sure. Uh, Jimi Hendrix is just doing kind of an impromptu jam. It wasn't with uh, his band. And actually, there's a lot of... Uh, there's video of this, uh, from what I understand. Um, but there's a lot of rumor about who's playing with him in the jam. Um, one of them was that uh, uh, Buddy Miles was playing. Uh, Buddy Miles has gone on to say later on that he wasn't there for this. Um, so nobody knows exactly who's playing uh, with Jimmy. But again, this was kind of an impromptu thing. It wasn't scheduled. Uh, the scene club was in New York City. was just some place that Jimi Hendrix hung out. And he decided to do uh, just jump on stage and start playing. He had just come off a tour. And uh, Jim Morrison happened to be there. And he just walked up and grabbed the mic. Uh, apparently this was recorded by Jimi Hendrix. I, I, I wasn't aware of this. Uh, anytime he did shows... He would pull out a little recorder and record it and you know more for himself uh, for ideas later because he would just kind of jam sometimes and uh, that's how this was uh, recorded 
I don't think this has ever been officially released. I think from what from what I read, he gave a copy of the tapes to somebody that he knew, and that person released it uh, after he died. But uh, some really interesting stuff. There's also a, a song on here, a 12 minute jam called "Bleeding Heart," that's really really good. Until Jim Morrison gets on the mic again, and this time he's screaming "Suck my ass" uh, to some girl in the audience. It's weird stuff. It's definitely interesting, and if you run across a copy of it, I, like I said, I found it for really cheap. I, I highly recommend picking it up. It's it's just kind of a nice little thing to have in the archive, you know. Um, let's flip through here real quick. I think one more, and then we'll get into the metal. Um, this next one, I, I just pulled this out. Uh, I hated this band when I first heard them. Uh, and then it kind of grew on me, and I ended up loving them. And, and all through the 90s, this was a favorite of mine. I saw them, uh, I think, uh, 95. I took my girlfriend to the show, and I've talked about this a couple of times. Um, it was one of the worst shows I've ever been to. Uh, in that, um, the band was amazing. Uh, but the opening band was Mike Watt. If uh, you're not familiar with Mike Watt, a famous bass player... Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the punk band that he was in. I can picture their album covers. Anyway, he was doing this solo thing by this point. Uh, again, I think it was 95. And uh, he had two drummers on stage with him. And a guitarist that barely played. He was doing bass. And it sounded terrible. The drummers were off. Uh, it was bad. And, and everybody started booing and throwing bottles and shit at him. Uh, and he lost it. He's going off telling people, I'm an old school punk, I'll come down and uh, beat the shit out of every one of you. Um, eventually, the booing got so bad, I mean, he was basically booed off stage. He left the stage, uh, and then this band came out, and it was Primus. Um, this is Miscellaneous Debris. This is an EP that they did of covers. Um, the best on here being Have a Cigar. This was 92 when this came out. Um, and though I was already a fan and already listening or, or was already aware of Pink Floyd, um, Have a Cigar was my kind of my introduction to that song, this version of it. Uh, and this got me uh, listening to Pink Floyd more. Uh, and uh, that's gone on to, to Wish You Were Here, which Have a Cigar is on, has gone on to become my, my favorite Pink Floyd uh, album. Uh, basically because of this but you've got uh, uh, they do Intruder from Peter Gabriel um, Sinister Exaggerator from The Residents Tippy Toes from The Meters and uh, Making Plans for Nigel I'm not sure who uh, originally sang that song but this is a really cool EP um, definitely worth picking up if you're uh, a Les Claypool or a Primus fan, if you haven't heard this, uh, really good covers. He's done a couple of cover albums over the years. Uh, he did one called uh, Rhinoplasty that's really good. And then uh, I've shown a couple of other from the Frog Brigade. Uh, the Frog Brigade, he actually does um, a couple of uh, Pink Floyd albums in full that are amazing. But uh, really cool EP, definitely worth picking up. Uh, so let's get into the metal. Um, this person, I picked this one up about uh, six or seven months ago. I've had this on vinyl for quite some time. Um, I bought the, the CD version uh, because of the bonus tracks. This is uh, The Eagle Has Landed from Saxon. If you've been watching me for a while, you've seen me show Saxon dozens of times. Um, about a year ago, I bought the Sax one of the Saxon box sets and showed that. Um, again, I've got this on vinyl. The reason I bought this, though, is uh, there's uh, six songs on here. Uh, that were live at Hammer at the Hammersmith Odeon in uh, 81 and 82. Um, and I actually like those tracks better than the actual out or than uh, the Eagle Has Landed tracks, uh, which are great by themselves. But uh, the band just sounded really good uh, uh, for that sh or for those shows uh, at the Hammersmith. Uh, so definitely worth picking up if you're a Saxon fan. I was just looking a couple days ago. It turns out that this was actually released on vinyl as a two LP set with those bonus tracks um, by Back on Black. So if any of you guys have heard that, put a note down below. Uh, let me know how it sounds. I've had really bad luck with Back on uh, Black lately. Um, a lot of their reissues just don't sound that good. Uh, next up, uh, just a classic album, Spreading the Disease. Again, I've got this on vinyl. I've got this on regular CD. I've got this on cassette, actually. Um, this is Spreading the Disease. Uh, 
the deluxe edition. It's called Spreading the Disease for 30 Years. And uh, the B-side has a bunch of, uh, or the, the second disc has a bunch of live tracks from Japan. Uh, and then a couple of uh, rhythm tracks, which I could live without those. Uh, one through eight was a, a live show from the Sun Plaza, Tokyo. And then tracks nine through 17 are just rhythm tracks, basically uh, instrumentals uh, of the album. Um, you know, uh, when I listen to this uh, in the car, I just let it play through. Um, I'm not really one for instrumentals. Uh, not that I don't like instrumental music, but uh, you know, if I want to listen to AIR or listen to uh, Aftershock or Armed and Dangerous, I'd rather listen to it with vocals. But uh, still cool, uh, worth picking up just for the Tokyo tracks. All right, next up. So this is a funny one. I've talked about this band a couple of times. Their debut album is an absolute classic. I love it. Um, it's definitely a favorite of mine from that era, but I, I didn't really like anything else after that. Um, there are two or three albums after that I didn't dig, and I just kind of stopped listening to them after that. Um, oddly enough, I saw them on the tour for this album and wasn't really a fan. They're a hometown band, too, and I've talked about this. The band is Flotsam and Jetsam. Um, I saw them at a killer show. Um, the opening band was Fear Factory, who were absolutely phenomenal. This is in 95. Uh, so Fear Factory was just kind of making a name for themselves. Uh, the second act was Korn. Uh, they had just released their debut. They sounded amazing. Uh, and then the third band to come on was Flotsam and Jetsam, who was a hometown band. This was their... Uh, the first show on the tour if I remember correctly so they're playing for their hometown audience in Phoenix and they sounded like absolute garbage um, I actually uh, we were in a huge amphitheater uh, that's no longer there uh, I actually laid down on my girlfriend's stomach in the grass in the back and took a nap <laughs> and then uh, about halfway through their set and then the final uh, band was Megadeth who were absolutely amazing so it was a killer show uh, however I literally fell asleep and took a nap during Flotsam and Jetsam but uh, anyway, I picked this up. This is a promo copy of Drift. I don't know if you can see the, the promo uh, stamp there. I actually liked it. Um, so for, for you guys that are uh, Flotsam and Jets fan, I mean, this just definitely isn't uh, their debut or their first couple of albums where they were more of a thrash band. But uh, they're still, I, I really ended up liking this. I was really surprised that I did. Um, so, if, uh, for you Flotsam and Jetsam fans, if there's any others that you recommend I uh, check out, uh, also put that in the notes below. Um, this next one, I'm really happy to finally have this one again. I had this on cassette years ago. Um, I've talked about this band. I got turned on to this band through a split EP called uh, Blisters on My Fingers. Um, it had two tracks... Uh, from Sepultura, um, they were Biotech and War for Territory off of uh, Chaos AD, and I bought it for that. I was a huge Sepultura fan by that point. Uh, and then it had this band on there called Prong, who I had never heard. Um, I had seen their albums floating around at this point, uh, but it had Cut Rate and Snap Your Finger, Snap Your Neck uh, off of The Cleansing, which is an amazing album. Love both of those tracks. After that, I went out and bought all their stuff that was available. Their follow-on album uh, is a favorite of mine. Uh, I absolutely love it. I, I love all their albums. Um, I'm, I'm happy to finally have this. I'd love to find this on vinyl. But this is uh, the Criminal, Criminal, Primitive Origins EP from uh, 87, I think. Yeah, 87. Uh, this is their, their first release. This is... Uh, much different than their later sound. Uh, on this EP and their first album, this was a just straight up crossover thrash. Uh, it's absolutely awesome. If you haven't checked this out and you're a thrash fan, you're gonna really dig this. Uh, just a really killer album. And again, I'm really happy to have this. I've already spun this one six or seven times. I may spin this again when we're done. Actually, speaking of what's spinning in the background, this is one I promised to, uh, to play in the background of a video for Scott. This is a, uh, a band called Generation Kill. And uh, this is the, the, the band that uh, Rob Dukes formed after he left Exodus. Or after, I don't know if he left or if he was kicked out. But uh, um, he was a vocalist for, I think, three of their albums. This also has uh, Rob Machete uh, from M.O.D. Uh, 
really killer thrash album. I I wasn't even aware that this was out. I I wasn't aware of this band. Again, I was at Half Price Books. They had this sealed uh, for like three bucks, and there was a sticker on the front that said contains members of uh, uh, Exodus and MOD, and it's it's very much in that vein. Um, I love every track on here, but one I'm not a fan of the title track, Red, White, and Blood. It's supposed to be kind of a condemnation of the government uh, and, and how they send out the military, uh, but it sounds more like a condemnation of the military. Um, other than that, I like every track on it, and that's a good track too. Just lyrically, I'm, I'm not really a fan of it, but uh, I, I really like everything else on here. Uh, really killer album, and I, I highly recommend picking that one up. Uh, so next up, a couple more classics. A couple of classics and then a couple of new releases uh, from 2016 that I finally got around to uh, checking out. Um, this first one, I briefly talked about this one on that live feed that uh, I did with uh, Scott Waters and with Nathan, uh, uh, Chemical Warfare 86. And uh, this is an album, this is a band that, that I was, I was kind of late to. I didn't get, to them, get into them until the mid-2000s. Uh, but once I did, I, you know, I, I've eaten up all their stuff. I, I love pretty much everything but one album that they've released. Actually, uh, I talked about that in the video, too. I'm not going to get into it again. Um, this is Iced Earth. Um, Iced Earth is is probably now become one of my favorite power metal bands. Um, not to take away from anything uh, from Halloween. Um, I, I love Halloween. Um, I love Gamma Ray. Uh, Gamma Ray is probably I, right there with Iced Earth, but I've just really gotten into Iced Earth. And uh, Schaefer is just an amazing writer. Um, lyrically, musically, the guy is an absolute phenomenon. Uh, this is the, uh, the debut uh, of Tim Ripper Owens in Iced Earth. This is uh, after he left... Uh, Judas Priest. I think he did another band uh, as well in between. Um, I think this is the best that Tim Owens has ever sounded. He's amazing on this album. Uh, it's funny. This album is generally considered... I mean, if you look at the reviews from fans and from uh, professional reviewers from the magazines, it's universally hated and it makes no sense to me. This album is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, look at the artwork. I don't know how well you can see it. The artwork is phenomenal. All the way through. And not just that, they did artwork inside the booklet too. Every song has uh, artwork. Just uh, really cool stuff. And it's all amazing artwork. I, I need to get this on vinyl. Just go through and share all this because the artwork is that good. So, a lot of people pan this for being nationalist or... or gung-ho American uh, and if they believe that they didn't listen to the album um, it, it's not anti-American I mean there's definitely some patriotism shown in here but um, this is his storytelling John Schaefer storytelling at its best um, he does do the Star Spangled Banner uh, which sounds amazing um, let's see uh, When the Eagle Cries uh, Twin Towers um, song about the Twin Towers. He does a song about Valley Forge. He does a song about Attila the Hun. He does one about the Red Baron. Um, but really, the the and all of those are phenomenal. But really, the uh, the masterpiece of this album, and it really is a masterpiece, is Gettysburg. Um, it's the last three tracks on the album. It's a each track is represents one day of, of the fight at Gettysburg. 
And and this is one where, as you're listening to it, you really need to have the book open. Because it, it really tells the story of Gettysburg in a way that I've never heard anybody do it before. Uh, the history is accurate. He does a good job of telling the story. But he doesn't just do it lyrically. Um, and that's why you really need to uh, sit down and actually read through the notes uh, of each of these songs. Because he kind of prefaces each day with what happened. And then he tells the story in the lyrics. Um, however, he's also telling the story in the music, too. So when you hear the drums do this, it kind of rep represents the cannons uh, flying across the battlefield. Um, I, I, it's absolutely amazing. And this is an album that, that I highly recommend you check out. If you're a fan of Iced Earth, or if you're a fan of Power Metal, uh, or if you just haven't given this a chance, um, go back and sit down and actually listen to the lyrics and and read through the story as you're listening to it um it, it really is a full-on experience and, and it's a it's a really killer album um next up this is a really cool album too um this is warped writers from the sword if you're not familiar with the sword uh, i have this one on vinyl too i just i was in the mood to listen to this a, a couple weeks ago and brought it down to the car and gave it a couple of spins um, this is my favorite album from the band. It's a concept album. Uh, if you're not familiar with The Sword, The Sword is a doom band. They kind of mix doom and it's kind of a, a doom 70s hard rock hybrid. Uh, amazing band. I, I love everything that they've released. Uh, uh, Warped Riders is, is just a killer album. It follows the story of an archer. Uh, it's a sci-fi uh, story. Um, it, it follows the story of an archer who's been kicked out of his village uh, or, or, or kicked out of his tribe. Um, and, and they just, the band just does a great job of telling the story. It's just really killer music to boot, you know? Um, so, next up, these are both albums I was hesitant to buy. These are both albums that have put out albums that I really liked and put out albums that I could I totally live without. Um, the first one, I probably never would have listened to if not for Renee uh, Holspa Metal uh, for you guys that uh, follow Renee. <coughs> uh, 2014, I think, uh, he listed this band's album as his favorite album of the year, which shocked a lot of people because this isn't the kind of music that, uh, uh, or this isn't the kind of band that most people would... Uh, expect Renee to show and the band is Avenged Sevenfold who uh, kind of started uh, I don't even know what they started off as I want to say I, I didn't listen to their first couple albums uh, um, I don't know I don't remember if it was Metalcore or, or what it was but uh, on their last album they I guess the last couple but their last specifically they went more uh, uh, just straight up thrash metal route and uh, so Based on Renee's uh, reviews, I went out and bought it, and, and I really liked it. Um, there's a lot of Megadeth and Metallica influence, and actually one of the songs, they basically take a Metallica riff and make a new song out of it, uh, which they got a lot of uh, hate for from the Metallica fanboys, but uh, I personally thought it was kind of cool. Uh, but uh, you definitely hear that influence in there. Uh, this one, they went more a traditional uh, metal route, with, and, and there's some progressive elements to it, too. But this is also a concept album about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, kind of the self-destruction of society. And I think they did a really good job with it. But this is uh, the stage, and it's kind of hard to see it. Really cool artwork, though. And what's uh, also kind of cool about this is that in the first week, they sold 76,000 copies. Uh, and, and what's funny about this is, uh, I mean, these guys have gone, I think all of their albums have gone gold at this point. They may have gone platinum on one or two of their albums as well. Uh, but they didn't announce this. They just, it literally just dropped one day uh, without any uh, any lead up advertising. Um, and they still sold 76,000 copies in the first week. But what's interesting about it is, uh, I believe I read that 72 or 73,000 of those were were hard, were physical copies. Um, so people were going out and buying 
the CD and the, the record as opposed to downloading it, which I thought was, uh, which is a really cool sign because this is not a band that guys in my age group and a lot of you that watch me would typically typically go out and buy. This is stuff that uh, more than twenty somethings are gonna are gonna go out and listen to. And I think that that's cool that in the first week they sold seventy two thousand copies to a group of individuals who have completely grown up in the MP3 age and who are less likely to buy hard or physical media uh, as a whole. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But it is, it, it did turn out being a, a really good listen. Um, I don't think it's as good as that last album where they were going more the thrash route. There's still a lot of thrash in here. Um, you still hear a lot of that Metallica and Megadeth influence. However, you see, you hear a little more traditional heavy metal and progressive metal in here as well. Um, a fun list, and I'll definitely spin this uh, again. And, and if I find this on vinyl, I'll grab it on vinyl too. Uh, but I really dug it. Uh, this last one, it's funny. I was just talking to Scott Waters on the phone about this band a couple days ago. Uh, this is a very schizophrenic band. Um, I don't think... It's almost like they flip a coin or they roll a dice and each side of the die has a different genre of music because it seems like with every release they do something completely different um initially they were kind of a, a melodic death mixed with metalcore band and then they went the straight metalcore route and then they put out an album that was straight up thrash which i, I really dug and that's what got me into the band um and then they've released this album this is like their sixth album maybe their seventh album but this is uh, Silence in the Snow from Trivium. Again, this came out a few months ago. Uh, I wasn't going to buy it. Like I said, like two or three albums ago, they released a really good thrash album that I really dug. Uh, their last album was okay. I've got it. Um, I could go either way on it. I haven't really revisited it. I've probably let's do it once or twice since I initially bought it. Um, there's some good stuff on there, but it, it's not as good as that the thrash album that they did. Um, this one is more just straight up heavy metal, uh, which I do dig. It, it is a, a decent album. It's better than I expected it to be. I, I don't know that I'd recommend. If you're a fan of Trivium, I'd recommend grabbing it. You're going to like it. I don't know that this is really going to bring them any new fans. I was also, the imagery, uh, the silence in the snow, the mask on the front cover, it's kind of a rip-off of uh, the last Death in June album where they've got a dude in, in, in the snow and in White Mask. Um, I can't remember the name of that, that, that album from Death in June, but, you know, this whole thing about the snow and the mask is kind of a rip-off of that, in my opinion. Um, however, it, it is a good album. Uh, would it make my top 25 of 2016? No. Uh, but it is a solid album. If you're a fan of Trivium, I'd get it. Um, I've, I've rambled on long enough. I could probably show another dozen albums, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, give me your thoughts, ideas, reviews, whatever. Uh, I'll talk to you soon, BC. Take care.